And uh, Dr. Shaban, I don't know what you prefer to go by, um, but uh, I, if, if you don't tell me otherwise, should I use Dr. Shaban? Is that correct? Uh, you can call me Shaban. I'm fine. Uh, well, this doctor is more formal, isn't it? <laughs> so and Shaban, the, the buildings that I see behind you, is that a yeah. view of some of the university yeah. buildings? No, this is, this is uh, our university, University of Management Technology, that you are uh, giving your seminar to. So all the faculty members are from the same university. So this is just a one uh, block of the university, and there are similar blocks of this university. How large is your university? Uh, well, How many are, students? Yeah, if are in you? terms of faculty uh, students, we have around twenty-five thousand students, and uh, for faculty, we have over. Uh, Sadia, correct me if I'm wrong. Seven hundred faculty members. Seven hundred plus. Yeah. And and sorry, I missed the student number. Did you say twenty-five thousand? Yeah, twenty-five thousand. Yes. 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 Okay. Understood. Um, and the English teachers that are with us now, I, I saw it's the Department of Linguistics and Communication. Yeah. Are you teaching uh, bachelor degree students uh, in your department? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we are doing a um, degree program at the Department of Linguistics and Communication and there is a Bachelor of English Language and Linguistics. And uh, then um, we are also doing uh, MPhil and PhD. However, we are responsible to teach uh, English courses across uh, the university. There are over 15 schools and uh, three institutes, uh, like all the students come to us for English language uh, instruction. So um, the, the faculty of uh, Department of Linguistics and Communication uh, offers services to all the schools and institutes at university. And, and do those who are studying in your department for a bachelor's, is the idea that they would graduate and become English teachers? Uh, not really, but most of them end up with, uh, you know, a, as an instructor, English teacher. And, uh, but I know like um, some of my students, they have been into civil services as well. They have been into media writing, content writing. Um, and they have been uh, doing their own private ventures as well. Very good, very good. This is helpful to know. It sounds like um, a major workload uh, if you're teaching English across uh, yeah. the entire university. That, that's, yeah. that's, that's quite a, uh, uh, a responsibility to take on. 25,000 students, are they, are they tested? to determine what level they're at. And then you're, um, if, can they test out of English, for example, if they have a high enough level? Uh, yeah, like uh, when we have uh, a freshman in the first semester, we always do a diagnostic test for them. And then we uh, do our instructions accordingly. Uh, but we are not teaching at the same time, 25,000 students, uh, like those who are registered in English one, um, Currently, like uh, they, they are, let's say, 15 sections or 15 classes or 20 classes. And then there are sections for English too, um, which is um, I am like a composition and writing, and then English three, English four. So like uh, students that we do not do diagnostic tests at English two, three, and four. However, we do it strictly in, at English one. And we, we look for the students, um, you know, existing the proficiency. And then accordingly, we devise our syllabus and uh, we teach them. Understood. Understood. Yeah. Well, thank you. This is, this is very helpful. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. So here I will start the uh, session formally by introducing um, um, Rilo David Fay first. And then uh, David Fay, you can uh, take over and then you will start your session. I'll just introduce a little thank bit. You, yeah. So David Fay, I believe, is a native Iowan, and he has been uh, with State Department from last uh, uh, probably 15 years or more, more than that. Like from 2003, he is working with U.S. State Department, and uh, he's been a teacher, a teacher trainer, a publisher who worked in the United States, who worked in Costa Rica, 
worked in Spain and Turkey. He has served as the regional English language officer in Tashkent, Moscow, Lima, and Anar Ankara. A Fulbright alumnus, he holds an undergraduate degree in Latin American studies and Spanish and graduate degrees in English language education, U.S. literature and resource management. Is that true? <laughs> it's <Wow>. true. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> I love studying. <laughs> wow, <laughs> lot of subjects. So yeah, now over to David Fay, would you uh, talk about uh, teaching writing skills to English as a second language learners? Well, thank you, Ms. Sadia, for the wonderful introduction. And, uh, and, and again, apologies if, I, if you prefer uh, a doctor uh, as, as a title, I'm, I'm ready to use that as well. Um, uh, thank you so much for your... So let me... Um, uh, you, you've heard a little bit about me. Um, I, will, uh, I, I will tell you at this stage that uh, I, I am here uh, in Islamabad. Uh, I've been here since November uh, as part of the Regional English Language Office. Um, as an office, we are, um, we are a team. Uh, you know one of our team members, uh, Dr. Iqbal, who's, who's with us today and who uh, has been in touch with you, I believe, uh, for many years. Uh, I know he sees you as a valued partner um, and uh, uh, wanted to accommodate this particular request um, about teaching writing, uh, and I was more than happy to to oblige. Uh, if if Dr. Iqbal says it's important, it means it's important. So um, he is one of our team members. Uh, we have several other team members. Uh, Mr. Majid uh, is here with me in Islamabad. Um, Mr. Rashid is also based here. He covers our digital outreach. Um, and then we have uh, Mr. Mudasir in, uh, in KP and Ms. Aisha in, uh, in Karachi. And, and that's the team that I am uh, fortunate enough, enough to work with. Uh, we uh, try our best to, to provide support to future and current English teachers across Pakistan. Um, we do that uh, primarily through a number of different professional development programs. Uh, one of the more common is the Online Professional English Network or OPEN program. And I'm wondering if you have the reactions button. I'm not sure if you're joining via your phone or your computers. I know Zoom's functionality changes a little bit from uh, laptop to phone, but if you have I see some thumbs up, that's good to see, all right. So my, my question is, if you have taken an open course, what was formerly called as e-teacher, um, now it's open, um, could I see any hands for anybody who may have taken an open course, an online professional English network? I'm sure there will be many hands. I don't know, Dr. Iqbal, I'm not seeing any yet. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that uh, Dr. Shaban is our, uh, one of our alumni. He had been to the States, he had been to uh, uh, Nepal, and he is also means uh, the was the participant of uh, open course. Means uh, I think that was critical thinking or something like that. So, so I remember a couple of uh, them are uh, uh, FLTA alumni. And uh, much more. You can and I see, see Sad Sadaf and Nahid as well have just raised their hands. So it looks like we have two more. And Amina, three. Okay, that, that's that's very good to see. Um, and um, I, I hope that uh, more of you are able to take advantage of those online courses. Uh, I think uh, they're not too big of an investment. It's about eight weeks long. Uh, and each week you could spend anywhere from five to 10 hours do taking the course. Uh, but because you have some colleagues already that have taken them, they would be able to give you a better idea about the amount of time they spend um, on the course. Uh, we have um, 
webinars, regular webinars, you'll hear me talk quite a bit about the American English webinar series and the AmericanEnglish.state.gov website. Uh, if you're familiar with the webinars or with the AmericanEnglish.state.gov website, could you show your hand again, please? Nahid, good. Sadaf, Rida, Sadia. Looks like there are two, two different Sadias, perhaps. Faiza, Shumela. Excellent, excellent. So you, you know where I'll be taking some of my content from today. Um, there's um, an important uh, bit of information I want to highlight with regard to these particular uh, sites and programs is all of the content is open source. So if you wanted to download it and reuse it in any way you wish, if you wanted to create your own online course using the open content, you could do that. Um, and, um, and, and please remind me um, if you are, I, I believe you are currently in class in person, is that correct? Or do you continue with an online education right now? Uh, well, uh, if, if you allow me to say something, yeah. So um, currently uh, the semester is, uh, you know, over and uh, we are doing examination. So uh, we were in person for a couple of weeks um, when the universities were open after COVID-19 uh, lockdown. So before that we did all online classes. Okay, and hopefully in the fall, uh, when you begin classes again, that the plan is to be in person, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So back to uh, the, uh, the content that I was talking about, um, I will mention some other exchanges, and of course, English Works and Access are two larger student-directed programs and in which we uh, ensure that all of our teachers involved receive also quite a bit of professional development. So that, that's really our main focus here, but we do want to um, help individual institutions as well as your own. Um, and one of those ways that I, I want to um, mention is that if there is a need such as developing um, writing skills, um, I, I will talk with you today for maybe 45 minutes or 60 minutes um, I know it's not easy to be interactive um, in this format, but I do welcome questions and comments as they come up. I will ask my colleague, Dr. Iqbal, to, to, to keep an eye on the chat box and interrupt me when he sees a, a relevant comment or a question that he feels I should address. So please feel free to use the chat box during this webinar whenever anything comes up that you want to point out or you want to ask about. And that's how we'll try to make this interactive. Um, if this is uh, an area in which you would like um, a longer term support, we have an English language specialist program in which we can find uh, an expert in the field who could possibly work with you over a longer period of time because what I'm going to be able to share with you in a brief 45 to 60 minutes is only going to be hopefully something to give you a few ideas to think about and maybe a few uh, items to try in your class, such as activities. I'll try to make it both somewhat theoretical, but also practical. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen. And let me know, are you now able to see a, a slide with cat got your tongue at the top? Can anybody give me a, a yes or a, a, a thumbs up if you can see it? Yes, there are yeses. Perfect. And um, when I go into slide mode, 
uh, unfortunately, I can no longer see the chat box. So, uh, Dr. Iqbal, I will rely entirely on you. And please, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, and that goes for you as well, uh, Dr. Sadia and Dr. Shaban. Uh, feel free to interrupt me if you see a relevant comment or question uh, that you would like to interject. Um, so uh, the, the first uh, question that I have is, um, I, I, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with this uh, expression in English, um, has the cat, cat got your tongue? Or as we often ask in less formal register, cat got your tongue? We don't need uh, to uh, preface it with a has. Uh, I'm wondering if there is an equivalent in Punjabi or in Urdu, uh, or perhaps we have some other languages represented as well, um, such as Pashto. Uh, is there an equivalent in any of those languages? And while you're thinking about that, feel free to type in your answer. Um, I will point out the two URLs at the bottom of this page. Uh, the Facebook page is designed for teachers. It's our Relo Pakistan Facebook page where we announce the, the upcoming webinars um, as well as uh, provide some other information. And then of course the AmericanEnglish.state.gov website that we had mentioned before. Any answers? No, yeah. so far. Oh, think, okay, okay, please. Sorry, I will. I probably will, um, take me a lot of time to write down. Like when uh, in Urdu we could uh, say that um, as the snake has sniffed you, like Sam Sungjana is probably when somebody is is unable to say something and when somebody is not able to express and we would just say Sam Sungye, so things like that. It's like a snake sniffed you. Ah. In a sense that you're so scared that you can't talk, is that the the, the connotation? It's too yes. stuck. Like it's it's more like if somebody's stuck and cannot say something. So it's Sam Samsun Jana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I say it correctly or not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you said it quite right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we we have uh, Atifa raise her hand. Atifa, you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. There are two two idiomatic expressions that we use in Urdu. Ek to kehte hain ki muh kutala lag gaya. So why are you so quiet? And second, muh mein dahi jamaya hai kya? So you're not speaking today. So yes. we don't know the idioms I'm used to. Punjabi ka bhi koi bata de. Main bata deta hu. Sure. <laughs> I will get I will get these expressions from you later, Dr. Iqbal. I am trying to learn uh, Urdu. It's a beautiful language. Uh, uh, wow. uh, truly, truly, truly beautiful uh, language. Um, um, so uh, I, I wanted to also point out that um, we often uh, make the mistake of disconnecting our, the two production skills. Uh, writing and speaking are, are intertwined. Uh, speaking is the more organic of the two skills. Uh, when we think about the idea of literacy, it comes with a level of education. It's an abstract practice compared with um, speaking, um, which is something that we create with our own, uh, uh, our own body. Uh, it's something that we uh, pick up naturally as children, uh, whereas uh, there is the excitement of any mother and father when their child becomes, uh, comes to the age of five, six, seven, um, and is at school where they uh, pick up the magical skill of reading and writing and the excitement that comes with um, that gain um, is not to be uh, undervalued. Uh, but they're both production skills. 
And I think one of the first issues to recognize is that many times we are not as good with writing as we are with speaking because we see it as a somewhat more abstract skill um, and one that requires a certain level of formality because it's recorded. And if it's recorded, people can come back and check it. And so there's a certain level of stress that comes from writing as well. And often what we need to do to break down that barrier to write is to connect it with speaking. Um, there are all kinds of good transcription activities to begin getting people to write, where they are allowed to speak on a topic. Um, and now, of course, with voice recognition technology more or less built into every computer, it's very easy uh, now to uh, automatically transcribe what you are saying. So I want to take a look at, at these main goals, uh, because I think it's, it's truly what drives the two production skills, uh, understanding the context. Um, are they writing or speaking in a vacuum? Um, or is there a reason? Uh, is there an audience? Uh, those are the two most fundamental uh, ingredients for eff effective speaking and writing. That's the context. Um, I've added urgency in the second bullet. Urgency is one of those that it, it can add stress, but it can also unblock uh, somebody who's unable to speak or write something. If they, for example, if somebody assigns you something to write and they tell you, it doesn't matter when you send it to me, whenever, or if they tell you, I need it in the next five minutes. Now, usually in that second case, they're more likely to be able to write or speak something. So urgency is, is a good thing to have. Thinking critically, we want to make sure that the, the uh, students feel that they are able to, to think, to create, which is the next bullet, um, and, and to really analyze what is going on. They should be adding something when they're speaking or when they're writing. Um, collaboration. Again, uh, we have trouble doing things in isolation. Maybe one of the troubles we've had with adjusting to online education, um, where we are, as I am right now, speaking into a screen, it makes it a much more difficult activity if we don't get some kind of feedback. Um, and then the last two, um, personalizing it, making sure it's something close to what you believe in, what you um, feel is true or right or needs to be shared. And then, of course, actually sharing it. So these are, these are kind of what we want to keep in mind for any of those production activities. And the, it's almost like a rubric that we can use. If, if we've got an activity, um, maybe it's an activity in your course book or an activity you found on the internet. We should be able to go through this checklist and see if we have accomplished or if this activity is accomplishing most of these items. If it's missing one or two, that's possibly not a big issue. I, um, I do worry if there's no context whatsoever that that would bother me. Um, but we, we really want to aim to uh, accomplish um, all of these in, in our activities, and it, and it should not be that difficult to do. So let's, let's try something. Uh, let's imagine you were given an activity like this. Um, do you see anything missing based on the rubric that I just gave you. And I can show you that rubric again if you want. If this is the activity, you've got your students in the classroom or in Zoom and you tell them break into pairs and talk about parks. 
which of those in the rubric, now let me go back, which of these is missing? And please feel free to write in the chat box and Dr. Iqbal, if you could tell me what the answers are. Uh, they are coming with the, so far, most of them have uh, written context. Excellent. Purpose. Anything? Good. Any others, Dr. Iqbal? Uh, there is instructions. <laughs> okay. Instructions are very important. I agree. Yes. But I, I did I did give instructions. I did say talk about parks. Mm -hmm. Break into pairs, talk about parks. Two steps. Any others? Uh, urgency is written, but I think urgency is there on the slide. You mentioned it. Yeah. So I didn't, you're right. I, if I had said something like talk about parks yeah. and give me the results of your discussion in two minutes, then I'm giving you urgency. But otherwise, there's no time frame that I've given you. So I'm missing out on urgency. Let's try another one. This time, again in pairs, I want you to discuss the issue of public spaces such as parks in cities. Public spaces such as parks in large cities. And again, what am I missing? Again, purpose. Good. Urgency. Good. It's not specific. Very good. Not specific at all. Very good. Good. Okay, we're getting the hang of this. Let's try the third pair. Discuss the importance of parks and playgrounds in big cities. Use cause effect sentences. Combine sentences with however and even though. What do you think is missing here? Personalizing. Excellent. I suppose you could kind Urgency of personalize again. it. Urgency, excellent. Sharing context. Okay. Purpose, context. Okay. There's another problem with this, an issue. Let's call it an issue. There's another issue with this particular activity. Um, it's not in the rubric that I gave you. It's not among one of the goals that I gave you. But perhaps some of you can identify what the issue is in this particular activity. Let me put it another so, way. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Iqbal. No, nothing. Uh, I couldn't find anything except context. Means okay. length of the text. One of the comment is length of the text. How long okay. the essay should be means clear purpose, Okay, very good, very good. Um, this um, is actually one of those activities that you often see, especially in the more traditional course books. Um, it's rare to find it in a fairly modern course book or among the modern activities, um, but it's an emphasis that is placed on accuracy and on a particular aspect of grammar. Um, what do you think that does to fluency? Do you think it increases fluency or decreases fluency? It decreases fluency. It decreases. 
Thank you. It because definitely... there are constraints that they have to use, however, and even though. And there are also, there is a question that you have to use cause and effect sentences. So all these things, they will reduce fluency. Very good, thank you. Yes, it will add to the confusion. Um, in fact, I would almost wager that this approach would most likely um, take uh, freeze the uh, freeze the uh, students. Um, I think uh, it would be a, a, a Samsunjana situation, if I can say it like that. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> it would be. <laughs> it is right. <laughs> it it would be as if a snake sniffed them. Um, I cannot imagine. I, I certainly don't want to be part of this discussion. I'll, I will tell you that. Very good. The last pair. Let's take a look at this one. You are two neighbors and you know there is a town meeting tomorrow to, to decide what to do with an empty space across the street from where you both live. One idea is a park. Another idea is a parking lot. One of you will be at the town meeting. So, what are we missing in this particular pair work? One comment is purpose, task, instructions. Uh, yes. Uh, can, can, can I say something? Please. Sure, sir. Uh, my, 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 my question is that why in cause and effect expressions, connectors such as however uh, are more relevant? Uh, because these are concessional uh, markers. Uh, in fact, maybe in my view, uh, because of due to owing to as a result of Consequently, uh, eventually, these uh, discourse markers might be more uh, feasible for the students uh, to establish the relationship between cause and effect. A very, very good point. Yes, I, I think you've um, identified a flaw in pair three. Uh, if you are truly trying to connect the grammar focus with the purpose of the pair work, then I would definitely agree with you. Um, what I think we were actually getting at, I think some of your, your colleagues definitely uh, pointed it out, was even if you were to, to make the, um, um, uh, the kinds of words or expressions that the students were required to use in pair work three, um, more accurate, um, more relevant to the task, even then it would be a situation where um, they would probably not be able to, to speak. But, but thank oh. you for pointing that out. That is a very, oh, oh. Um, a very good, very good, uh, very good catch as we would say. Uh, 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 thank you very much. It was, it was just uh, 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 a, a thing that I wanted to share. Otherwise, uh, as you are uh, sharing these things, really uh, very uh, enlightening, and uh, we are grateful thank for you. that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for speaking up. That's exactly what I want to hear, and that's what I. Uh, that's what makes. Uh, presentations more interesting uh, when it's not just one person who's who's speaking. So thank you so much. And and I apologize because I'm in the screen view um, with the PowerPoint slide. I cannot speak. I cannot see uh, even if I put it in this form. I, I cannot see who who spoke. So I, I apologize, sir. Um, uh, I cannot see your name or your picture in any way. Um, but I am acknowledging that you um, provided a my, very good comment. Um, uh, my, my name is uh, uh, Rao Jalil Ahmed. I'm uh, here at Thank uh, you. DLC. Okay. 
Thank you. I now I see it. I I, I do see it now. Rao Jalil. Thank you, Rao Jalil. Thank you so much. Um, so back back to pay, pair work four. Let let me put all of them together now. Um, and here we have a, a chance to see the the difference. We go um, in terms of number of words from the smallest to the largest. Uh, but but I do um, want to emphasize again how important each of these uh, indicators are. Um, having a context, having purpose, audience, urgency, um, being able to collaborate, being able to think critically, um, being able to personalize, all of these aspects are important um, to any kind of task. And we'll be talking about the difference with writing, but to be honest, there very, very similar in this aspect. If you were to write about parks, it's far too open-ended of a task and we're missing out on too many of the rubrics um, or indicators in the rubric, excuse me. In pair two and pair three, we're getting closer, but we're still not helping the students. And then in pair four, we have, got, we have come quite a bit closer. I, I do agree that there's still probably um, something we could do to give a better sense of context, possibly by better explaining who these people are, giving a bit of a background, maybe adding um, a kind of a, a dramatic um, uh, twist to this particular uh, pair work would, would be, um, would, would make it a more interesting thing that would drive uh, communication. So if I were to sum it up, I, I believe these are truly the three core uh, aspects that we're after. And again, this is just as relevant for speaking as it is for writing. In the virtual world, uh, perhaps um, some of you have used some of these tools. Um, if you have, please uh, write them into the chat box and let Dr. Iqbal know. Uh, if there's another uh, resource that you've used, please also share that resource in your, um, in your uh, chat box. I would like to see what those are. Uh, any, any responses that you can see? Oh, I am seeing some now. I finally, <laughs> there, there you go. I'm finally able to pull up the chat box. Yeah. Dr. Iqbal? Oh yeah, WhatsApp, Facebook is more there. Like uh, LMS, but LMS you need to mention which LMS and uh, there is Mentimeter, Facebook, mm. and then is again WhatsApp, Moodle, YouTube. Okay, I'm I'm not familiar Canvas. with Mentimeter. I Canvas. I am I'm not sure who shared Mentimeter, but if if you Shumaila want to Nakri. just Shumaila, do you want to give? Um, I don't know if you have a voice, but uh, you could type it if you like, uh, or say it out loud. What what does Mentimeter do? I think she can speak. Uh, she has permission to. Yeah. I don't want to put her on the spot if she if she doesn't want to. Gia, I see it. Uh, uh, she is here. Yeah. Mentimeter for uh, creating the polls for getting the responses from the students. And in English activities as well. And in English, I, I'm sorry, Shumaila, I didn't hear the last part of it. In creating different uh, activities related to the topic. Okay, so multiple users go in and then they're able to communicate in a different way once they're in there? Yeah, and we have the response there uh, as it is. Uh, we can get the response live on the Mentimeter. Okay. I, th I think it sounds, I, I wonder if it's a little bit like, are you familiar with Padlet? I wonder if it's a little bit like Padlet. 
Uh, well, I haven't yet uh, used it, so I cannot comment on it. Okay. Well, pa Padlet and Concept Board are quite similar in that you have a shared physical space and everybody can write something in that physical space. Almost like, uh, in, in some ways, it's like uh, having a, a, a wall in your classroom where students could come up and write something and everybody could see it. Um, the, the other one I want to point out is VoiceThread. Have any of you used VoiceThread? Possibly no. Uh, VoiceThread is um, a, an opportunity to make short recordings, audio recordings, um, and then other students can respond to those audio recordings by recording their own voice. Um, and of course, they could also write as well. So it's, it's a nice way, again, possibly to get around um, the, um, the stress of writing initially, um, to begin working through ideas before putting pen to paper. Um, but uh, the, the key to all of these is the collaboration that it provides. And the idea of even um, collaborating, for example, on a Google Doc um, adds a certain level of, of excitement, um, but also um, really cements this idea that at least you have more of an audience than the teacher. Because if there's one thing that can truly hinder writing, it's where the student writes and only the teacher reads it and grades it and returns it to that student. It's critical to be able to um, encourage students to broaden the audience, to include other readers, and to incorporate that into the actual um, uh, task or assignment itself. <clears throat> Excuse me, many apologies. Um, so a, a few um, activities uh, that, um, again, to build up the production skills that I just want to point out. Um, one is the two-headed expert. Um, this is a fairly simple activity, and you could actually do it um, in writing with a Google Doc. Um, uh, if we try it in, um, well, let's try it first speaking. I will... Um, I will ask uh, if it's okay, Ms. Sadia, to, um, I get to do it with you. Um, and um, the way it works is each of us can only say one word at a time, uh, but we try to make full sentences. And um, we would start usually with a question and Dr. Iqbal, uh, might you um, ask a question to us about teaching writing? Mm hmm Should I ask now? Please. Yeah. Means uh, how we can involve our young graders uh, in writing tasks. Young, sorry, our young? Young students. So, I, uh, Ms. Sadia, would you like to do this with me? I'm not sure she's able to hear us. Uh, let's try. Um, Shaban, would you like to try this with me? Sure, sure, why not? Okay, so again, we can only say one word at a time. We need to respond to Dr. Iqbal's question. Uh, and uh, let's see. Um, I? Um. I would say we. No, no, no. You, so I already you said need I. To, you need to add next You need to next add a word one. after I. One word. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I would. Yeah, just one word. So you just say would. Would, would yeah. Try. Uh, to. Make. Writing. More interesting by um, incorporating drawings 
um, imaginative music um, thrilling stories um, explanatory Oh, sorry, it, it doesn't work. Uh, it's an adjective. Attractive. It could work. Yeah. I would have to come yeah. up with a noun, though. You're, you're, yeah, you're, yeah, you're, yeah. You're putting me yeah. in a difficult position. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so let, let me uh, attractive activities, um, powerful images. Sentences. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's going to go on and on. I have, I have a feeling we there, could, we could there go should on be until... a period then. <laughs> we could, this could go on until midnight. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think we, I think we gave a pretty good answer. Uh, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Shaban. I, Thank you. I don't know, Thank Dr. Iqbal, are you happy with our answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed it. And this is a tough so, activity, by the way. Uh, yeah. You, yeah, you yeah, could, yeah. you. Sorry, Shavan, you were going to say something. Well, well this is this is uh, this is something uh, very uh, I, I should say active that can engage you in and uh, it is uh, productive. So um, it, it engage you in uh, a dialogue and a conversation, and probably it can um, you know uh, push you to use uh, your active uh, linguistic repertoire. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um... It, it does all of those and, and more. And, and you could imagine adapting this to a writing assignment, uh, again, using something like Google Docs, where uh, two or three, it doesn't have to be two-headed, it could be three-headed, it could be four-headed, but each student would take his or her turn to include one word. Uh, and they would then build out, um, uh, they would have to be given some kind of question or some specific um, guidelines for what they're supposed to write, but it makes it a collaborative task. Um, uh, gossip time, I'll show you in a second. Picture perfect, I'll also show you. And have you ever, I think I've got slides for all of those. Have you ever um, is, is based on uh, a, a grouping of games um, these games are from the American English website. I, I'll show that uh, towards the end. Um, but it's a, a chance to try to turn production into something fun, just so that it's not always got this very formal academic weight. Uh, and, and the idea here is like any kind of exercise, writing to needs a warm up period. If we go straight into writing a 10 page thesis um, or, or, or a 20 page paper about something, uh, it's daunting um, and it really um, is not necessarily going to build up those, those, um, that fluency that students also need to learn. So I think warming up with fun activities is absolutely crucial. Um, and these are simple ones and they're, a chance to personalize and to collaborate. And again, this is a speaking activity, but so easy to turn into a writing activity. Um, same with gossip time. This is where some sentence is created, a, a, uh, a statement is made. He carries a family picture with himself everywhere he goes. What are the assumptions? Well, his family is very important to him, or perhaps his spouse makes him do it. Could be either of those. So you've got, again, a statement and assumptions, and this is a chance, again, to try to get some kind of um, ideas flowing. Um, and if I were to ask you one of the more outrageous ones, this last one, he has a sock tied around his neck. What assumptions or guesses could you make? Feel free to speak them if you'd like or to write them in the chat box. 
he has a sock tied, or whoops, I am so sorry. He has a sock tied around. He is lazy, he is careless, he is messed up. He has a scar on a neck. His neck. Oh, that's a good one. He has a scar on his neck. Oh, I like that one. Amma, thank you. And then he is sick. He is trying something new. Starting a new fashion. Why not? Very good, Nahi. Excellent. So I, I did actually have a professor at the university who did this. Um, but he only did it in the winter. Um, and he basically said it was a way of keeping his neck warm. He thought the sock was the perfect way, better than a scarf. For some reason, he preferred socks to scarves. <laughs> Good, Saida. I love it. He is being himself. Yes. I. <laughs> why not be yourself? So that's the gossip time. Picture perfect. Again, getting some kind of picture that speaks to you. Um, and what, one of those ways, um, and of course, with Google searches, you can find all kinds of crazy things going on. Um, I like to go to Pulitzer Prize winning photographs. Um, but if we were to focus, for example, on this picture to the left, um, and again, make assumptions based on the picture. So instead of given, uh, being given uh, some text, um, a statement, you have a picture. Um, and if you were to look at that picture, what assumptions or what guesses could you make about this picture on the left with the woman? Amna, you win a prize. She has been given a dare. I love it. That's brilliant. She is Very an good. insect lover. She is uh, insects as pet. She has been given a deer. And then is uh, she loves insects. She is numb. She is giving up uh, all with her pets, calm in difficult situation. And uh, environmentalist, insect lover, doing a shoot to save insects. She is uh, familiar to insect keeping. She is I at ease it. with her troubles. Excellent. I, and Atifa, she is numb. That's also brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. And, and so many of you wrote um, uh, this idea of, of loving insects. Um, and, and you are right. She actually is um, a, a scientist at the Smithsonian Museum. I did not uh, put a, a caption or include a, a website. Um, I, I would have given it away, I think, if I had. But the Smithsonian being one of our research institutions, um, she is the leading uh, bug authority. And, and in, a, in a way, she's making a statement about um, how important insects are uh, to, uh, to the environment, to, to life in general. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you would feel comfortable with having those bugs on you. I'm not sure I would feel, especially the couple of large ones there. Um, but she obviously is, uh, is very, uh, very much at peace with it. Um, so let me, let me move ahead. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to uh, shift this instead of Kabul and Islamabad, I'm going to look at Islamabad and Lahore. If I want to write now, and I want to look um, at, at, a, at one of the approaches to writing that I think fits in well with academia, um, but one of the other things, um, Shaban, that you had pointed out in your email was um, the idea of, of job skills. Um, and of course, uh, when you get into job skills, it's very important to use critical thinking. Um, and to be aware of genre and register. Um, and especially now with so much writing happening informally, such as the chat box. This chat box is very informal register. Uh, you're writing without full sentences. You're simply trying to communicate an idea. So 
the idea of writing, I, I see uh, Shabana, you wrote breaking stereotypes. The whole idea of a text message, a WhatsApp message is to be as direct as possible um, because you have limited time and it takes a while to use those fingers on this um, small uh, keyboard uh, that, we're, that we're left to work with. And, and so we're, we're using writing in very different ways. Yeah. So if we come back to longer, more formal kinds of writing, um, I could ask for um, something where you're comparing two cities. I could ask the students to write uh, a comparison, three pages, um, no more than, um, oh, I don't know, uh, something around a thousand words. Uh, compare the two cities. Yeah. Um, you will see the categories on the left. These are Wikipedia categories, you could say. They're not specifically from Wikipedia, but if you were to look at some key areas to compare, uh, then you could probably say that, you know, population, climate, 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 excuse me, infrastructure as in transportation, geography, history, people, um, other, please feel free, to, feel free to suggest some other possibilities, some other categories. Um, there is one issue I see here with people. Um, if you look at all of these population, climate, infrastructure, you're, you're looking at things that are measurable that you could probably say are factual. And then we get to people, and did you notice the people of Lahore? I don't know if this is true. Are they are they friendlier and more hospitable than the people of Islamabad? Are the people of Islamabad if, uh, more uh, hardworking? I think you will have to come to Lahore to check that out. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Means like I was about to say that uh, means uh, uh, David. Uh, I think you haven't experienced Lahore. Otherwise, uh, you won't talk about Islamabad. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> All right. I, I, I can't wait. I truly can't wait. Um, maybe for other, and, we can put that. Yes, please, Dr. Iqbal. Yeah, someone quoted very famous quote here. Lahore, Lahore. Lahore, Lahore. Lahore is Lahore. Lahore is Lahore, yes. I love it. Lahore, Lahore. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well uh, i think uh, should i speak here yes please tamsila okay I, I think we should avoid when we are making comparison and when we are making contrast between any two entities these can be cities city uh, cities or people or books or whatever we should avoid uh, the absolute terms like uh, it is hard working and it means that that's not, the other is not. So it can be more hardworking, more friendly, hospitable, like this. I mean, when we are making comparisons, because it's it gives the impression that if the people living in Lahore, they are more friendly, it means that the people in Islam, but they are not. So we should add these terms when we are making comparison more. Okay, am I right? Yes, very good point, Tom Sila. Excellent point. I, I completely agree with you. Um, it, it is problematic. I, I agree that include, including this people category with um, very subjective adjectives or subjective characteristics is, is problematic. Um, I want to ask another question. I'm not sure if any of you have seen it yet. But the visual representation, this graphic, already has a bias in it, a visual bias. If you forget the words for a second, just think about two words in this entire, entire graphic. One is Lahore and one is Islamabad. Do you see any bias in this graphic? Huh. Saida, bravo, bravo. Islamabad has much more space. So already in this visual representation, there's a bias. And 
a lot of times we don't necessarily recognize that. It doesn't jump out at us. Um, we can manipulate it. Let me, let me see if I can, if I go into this uh, and do this, and then let's go back to the full screen. I think it's back to the full screen now. I've yep. yes, I've changed it around now and I've given Lahore more space. And so what we're doing visually with this graph is what I would ask students to do in writing. Why would I do it? Because it's done every day in the news. Um, whether we like it or not, even if it's a report on facts, even if we're looking at um, uh, a series of 12 paragraphs that are capturing a news item, how you position those paragraphs, which paragraph comes first, which paragraph comes second, which paragraph comes third, makes all the difference in terms of how people understand it, and it can create a bias. And so let's take a look at a more serious writing activity based on this comparison of the two cities. So here we've got the, the initial task, write an essay that compares the two cities. We've already established, going back to our initial indicator list, that we're missing out on audience, we're missing out on context, we're missing out on urgency. Um, we're, we're really missing the mark if we stop here. But look at number two now. Imagine you were writing a report in order to decide which city would be better for one of these four things. A regional climate change summit, a UNESCO World Heritage Site meeting, a conference on public health education challenges. Public, I said health, public education challenges hosting a delegation of public space and park experts. So if we were to, for example, pick the Regional Climate Change Summit and come back to this, let's imagine it's a competition and each city like is done with the Olympics every four years where there's a competition between cities in the world to host the Olympics. Let's imagine that both Lahore and Islamabad want to host this climate change conference. What would you possibly want to mention in your first paragraph to emphasize the importance of Lahore over Islamabad. Any suggestions? Uh, well, I, I would say like uh, Lahore is uh, one of uh, the largest metropolitan city with uh, more industry than Islamabad. And uh, there is a more emission of carbon in Lahore uh, than Islamabad. And uh, yeah, and Lahore is less green. Uh, so these are primarily a couple of points. There are many others. Excellent points. Yeah, things, things that we're not seeing necessarily on this graphic, but I think Lahore presents itself as a bigger challenge because of the size of the city, because of its industrial base. It's, it's much more representative of large cities around the world than Islamabad. Islamabad, Islamabad is, 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 is a very unique sort of city. It's small. Um, it doesn't have the industrial history um, that cities like Lahore or Karachi have. So I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, ooh, I see a good comment. More population, more opportunities. I like that. Definitely. Lahore is more lively. Okay. Diversified historic. culture and population. Very nice. And, and with a historical city, that works very well with the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Um, you would want to take somebody to a place that probably has a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site or has candidates for becoming UNESCO World Heritage Sites than a place that doesn't. Um, and, and so you've got a lot of, 
you've got a lot of different ways that you can take what appear to be facts and skew them. And I'm not saying that this is necessarily what we want students to always do in their writing, but we want them to recognize the importance of the order of facts. We also want to give them the context they deserve, the audience they deserve, and of course, a sense of purpose. So here there's a, a very uh, specific purpose for writing. And if you look at job opportunities, communication is communication with purpose. When you get to the workplace, you are communicating with a very specific reason to communicate. If we do not give them those reasons, then we are not preparing them for the, for the workplace. Um, and, and here again is the third one of how to contextualize this idea of bias. And, and if you do this activity, be certain to um, have a follow-on activity where other students read each other's writing and they identify the bias. So you've got a phase where you're creating the bias, but you need to have a phase where you recognize the bias as well. That's critical. Do not do it if you're not recognizing the bias. They need to be able to identify it. Um, I will leave you with one very, very key component. And this time I'm going to ask you to put on your grading hats. Uh, teachers love to grade unless you, walk home with a stack of papers this high and you know you've got to do it over the weekend. That's the thing you want to avoid. But let's imagine you have two students. There's student A and there's student B. They're beginner level students, very low level students, and they've been asked to write a little bit about a time they were afraid. Low level students, beginner level English, um, and I'm going to ask you, I'm not giving you a rubric to grade. I'm only asking you to use a holistic approach. So whatever your teacher instinct tells you, let it speak and give a grade. So this is the first one, student A. I will let you read it. I will let you read it quietly. Okay, and here is student B. Okay, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the highest grade, one being the lowest, if you could write in your chat box, I'll let you react any way you want. You don't have to if you don't want to, but you can react any way you want. Student A again. A six, B four point five. A six point five and B Five. Okay, 10 A being the seven. highest score, one yeah. being the lowest. Yeah, yeah. And your student B again. A 6.5, B 5, A 7, A 5, B 4. Okay, so I, I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> very good. All right. Ah, <laughs> yeah. uh, ah, Tamsila, very good. Very nice. I'm glad you wrote that comment. It has no grammatical mistake, although the expression is very poor. Four or ten. <laughs> oh, and now we have a tie score. Okay. I, 
I realize what I've do what I'm doing to you is a little unfair. I'm putting you on the spot. I've given you no context for grading. Um, mm -hmm. I will point out something. Mo most of you had A above B, and um, I saw that comment about the accuracy of A. A is definitely more accurate. I agree with you. Um, there are fewer mistakes, grammatical mistakes. I agree with you. But I want you to look again at B. And I'm going to ask you, what do you see as the redeeming features of students, of student B's writing? What are the, the positive aspects of B? Narration, more imaginative. B is better narrator. Creativity, storytelling aspect, thinking skill, no punctuation marks. <laughs> Ooh. Complex structure. Awesome. Has much to tell, but unable to. Although the Very sentences good. are grammatically wrong, but still they make sense. Sentence good. structure. I, it, beautiful, beautiful responses. I, I'm really happy to see all that you were able to catch. Um, and, and here's, I guess what I'm going to get at with this, it really depends on what we want from our students. I will say that if you give a higher grade to student A, you need to be ready to live with the consequences as we all do as teachers, whatever we give as grades, we need to live with those consequences. And the consequences of giving an A student, the A student, a higher grade is that you are valuing accuracy over fluency. Um, I think based on your comments, you all saw the narration, the creativity, the, these are aspects of fluency. Um, and if we do not find a way of valuing these, I'm not saying you always have to grade in a certain way, but there needs to be a time in which we also promote fluency and good communication. This is um, a level of creativity and storytelling that student A doesn't have. I, student A might have it. Student A might be very creative and might be a good storyteller, but student A doesn't wanna take risks because maybe student A knows that if she or he takes risks, she or he will get a lower grade. And so we're left with this very important question as teachers, and that is, what is it that we want to achieve from the writing task? Do we want students to be able to open up and express themselves and, and get the ideas flowing? Or is it a time when we actually want that very, very careful accuracy? My own opinion on that in most cases, and it's not always the case, but in most cases, we want to make sure that there's a level of comfort and fluency based on purpose, audience, and urgency. That once they've created that in their second draft, their third draft, their fourth draft, they move closer to accuracy. Accuracy is something that is a lot easier to get later but if you begin with accuracy, if you begin with this, excuse me, with student A, and then try to move this into something more fluent, more narrow, more descriptive, you're, you're not going to be able to do it. The student will have to rewrite entirely if, if they are faced with that. So um, here's, here's what I'd, I'd just like to, to leave you with. Um, let, me, let me just show you from, uh, there we go. There we are. So um, if you have a chance to see here, um, the American English state gov, this is what I really want you to explore because if you click on so resources and programs webinars, if you click on webinars, you'll see a category here called reading and writing. 
And there are about uh, over 100 webinars total. I think if for reading and writing category, about 15, maybe 15 to 20. But here's, for example, um, using social media to engage students to teach narrative writing. Here's something about writing for newspapers. Um, business English writing something very connected to this question, Siobhan, that you asked about preparing students for the workplace. If you're looking more at academic writing, there are two excellent webinars for um, academic writing and, and the list goes on. So um, these are, are more or less one hour episodes. Um, it's, it's somebody speaking. Um, it was recorded uh, similar to what this webinar is like. Uh, and um, I, I do hope that uh, it's something that you um, explore. So that's, that's all I have for you today. Um, I'm happy, uh, I still have a few minutes. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, I, I'd be happy to, uh, to, uh, to hear them. Uh, well, well, David, I have one question. Uh, in fact, um, yes, um, we are dealing with uh, learners who are who come from various, uh, you know, uh, language background, and uh, they they have uh, various levels of language uh, proficiency. Uh, we are also uh, teaching to PhD and MPhil students who are advanced learners of English. Do you really think that uh, in those cases when they are working on their dissertations? Um, uh, fluency will matter there um, because uh, mostly teacher pursue accuracy at advanced level. Yes, I, I would argue that fluency, even at the level of a dissertation is critical. More critical though, is, the, in, in, is gathering the research that's needed to, to create the dissertation. Um, I think many times the, the bigger mistake that um, uh, PhD candidates make is that they try to proceed with their writing before they really have the data that they need. Um, once they've got the data, once they've reviewed the literature, um, they begin sketching out a plan for their dissertation. While they're sketching out their plan, they need the fluency. Um, they need to allow themselves to, to write freely and to write openly. Um, and even if much of what they're writing is not used later. It's, it's, it's moving the dissertation in the right direction. Um, That's great. Any other questions? Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much for your uh, kind uh, and informative lecture. Sharing things in a simple way is a very difficult art to learn, and we, you did it really uh, wonderfully. Thank uh, you. My, my, uh, my, my question is uh, of course, uh, this is the rule of the game that fluency comes first. But for, for developing fluency, you need an environment, a uh, near native environment where fluency tasks and activities do work. But in a situation like ours, where it is quite remote from near native, it is uh, more uh, uh, manipulated in, in a different way. P students from different backgrounds come. And if we don't focus on accuracy skills right from the start, uh, there might be some problem in developing their even what we can do. Uh, mm -hmm. So that would be an ideal uh, fluency leading to accuracy. But in a situation where bilingualism is there, translation is uh, has to be there, uh, we have to mix uh, accuracy and fluency in order to make it more feasible. Uh, this is just my uh, sharing my experience as a teacher. Uh, and I need your guidance uh, uh, on that. 
Yeah, I, 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 you've got a point, Raul Jalil. I, I'm not sure I completely agree with needing a native-like environment. Um, I, I, I will admit I've spent most of my life um, outside of my, my, my native country, the U.S., um, and, um, and, and so in non-native non -native English-speaking environments, and, and often with students who are really uh, just starting out in English of, of different age levels. Um, and, and I think that uh, a lot can be accomplished fluency-wise, um, even, um, even if it's with pictures or with pantomime, with drama, there's, there's a lot, uh, there are many different ways to um, build fluency even without words. Um, and if you look at student A and student B, you know, they were low level writers and, and yet you have a real story with student B. So I, I think fluency can come even at the, that lower level, but, but I, I, all, all I would say is that if, if, you, if you come on too strong with the accuracy at the beginning, and, and again, we're talking in very vague terms right now, but I, I think if you come on too strong with, with, with the focus on accuracy at the beginning, that you risk losing writers, that you, you, that you um, could possibly turn off um, uh, students' motivation um, or challenge their motivation more um, by not allowing them to focus on the communicative act. Because at the end of the day, the reason why we have any kind of language in the world, any kind of communication, it's because of a need to communicate. And so there, there, there has to be a need um, to, to, um, to express oneself. Um, we, we don't do it in isolation and we, we don't do it simply to sound academic or to sound professional. Um, there, there is a time for that. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I think you're right. But, but I, I would say that if, if you um, are looking at motivational factors, it's very important to get that fluency going. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Raul Jalil. Really, thank, 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 you. thank you for your participation. Really wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Now I would like to call upon Dr. Shaban for the note of thanks. And already you are, uh, David Fay, you are already receiving a lot of thanks from the audience. You can see that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, David Fay, uh, I'm really grateful. And um, especially um, like um, on such a short notice uh, and to prepare a presentation, uh, such interactive and helpful presentation, I'm sure that all of us have taken something for our classroom and we, we can experiment um, in our classes. And um, so it has been really very helpful, especially the activities part. And uh, so we would love to be, uh, to learn more on this. And uh, maybe uh, if you would like to uh, visit Lahore, so you will find UMT is over there. I would love to. So, most welcome when you are open for traveling and face to face, uh, but even we are open for virtual uh, conversation. So um, I am even like, uh, if you have uh, some American fellows uh, planning in fall 2021, uh, we would like to um, you know, provide them a venue to stay with us a little longer and, uh, and, and also kind of a teacher training and professional development and interaction with our students. So we would like to collaborate for, uh, how we can improve uh, language skills of our learners. Thank I'm thank also you. grateful, yeah, thank you. And I'm also grateful to Dr. Iqbal for making this possible. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful to Dr. Iqbal, basically he's the person who could make this even possible. Thank you, uh, Dr. Iqbal for uh, your uh, efforts and your support and uh, finally, to Sadi Asi for coordinating and making this event a success. And uh, I'm thankful. So once again, have a wonderful weekend and uh, thank you. stay blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Shalan. Take care, everybody. Stay healthy, please, all of you. Allah Hafiz. Thank you. Allah